Greetings, everybody. Happy Sabbath. We are the day after Thanksgiving right now. So I hope you have had a good time for those of you who have met up with family and uh, probably eaten a little too much. For those of you who uh, weren't able to meet up with your family, you're with your family now. We want to welcome you back to our Bible studies on Friday nights. And uh, it's good to see everybody on Zoom and uh, some faces we haven't seen in a while, some new faces. So always a pleasure and uh, it's a, a boost for me. It's a, it's a testimony that you guys are giving me when I see you on here uh, every, every Sabbath. So uh, just welcome back and thank you for your support. We also want to thank everybody on watching YouTube. Thank you for your support as well and for sharing videos and liking them. Um, our videos have been viewed uh, tens of thousands of times. So we're, um, we know that seeds are being planted. And now that we had completed Daniel, you can uh, encourage people. They've got a three-year study that they can do that is on our YouTube channel and uh, plenty of revelation uh, material on there as well. Uh, tonight, we're going to study. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of evil, um, but the foundation and the premise is on why it's important for us to trust in the Word of God. So we'll uh, touch on some things that maybe you're a little familiar with, or maybe you're not. Um, these, as, as Paul and I prepare for these, there's so many avenues we can take uh, on this study. There's, uh, you know, different spokes on the same wheel. So it's exciting because it helps us already plan for our next study uh, based on some questions that, um, that we have as we study things that we learn, things that are recognized as the Holy Spirit moves us. Um, so we want to uh, kind of get into uh, the Bible and a little bit of great controversy tonight as well. So if you've got your Bibles with you, open them to the book of Ezekiel. That's where we'll start. And hey, if you have the book Great Controversy, there's a link we can put in the description tab, Paul, <laughs> a link to, to the Great Controversy. That's a book that's a commentary on the book of Revelation. Uh, it deals with a lot of end time uh, events, all the end time. Uh, scenarios that we're seeing take place now are really addressed in, in one way or another in the book, Great Controversy. So we would recommend uh, that you have that as a study companion when you study your Bibles. But let's go ahead and uh, pray and, and move along with this Bible study tonight. Let's bow our heads there, Heavenly Father. We just want to thank you for being God, for being creator. There's none like you. Uh, you sustain us because you love us. Uh, you've you redeemed us because you love us. Your son is coming to take us from this uh, wretched planet so that we can uh, be in heaven because you love us. And you're going to create a new heavens and a new earth because you love us. Help us to see your love as we study your word. Uh, we really need your will revealed to us, you know, exposed to us. We need uh, the light that comes from your throne to fill up our minds and our hearts and as we uh, learn more about you. We know that it's going to reveal uh, the liar and deceiver that Satan is. We need the Holy Spirit as we study so we can discern between truth and error, right and wrong. We give our hearts to you. We want them to be filled with uh, the truth that comes from your spirit, the truth that sets us free, the truth that will encourage us to endure another day. We need the strength that comes from you. We need your forgiveness for where we failed you and each other. So we just uh, give this time to you. We're so grateful for the Sabbath and for everything that you do for us. I pray for each person that's participating in this study. You know their hearts. You know uh, their lives, what they're going through, and uh, how, how they need you. So I just pray that uh, for everybody that's watching that uh, we would see the Holy Spirit work in our lives and we would recognize the conviction um, that the uh, Holy Spirit uh, presses upon us so that we can um, turn our eyes to you. We know that if we keep our minds stayed on you, you'll keep us in perfect peace. That's the peace that we're asking for. Not the peace that the world has, but the peace that passes understanding that comes from your kingdom. We just want to be in that atmosphere right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. In great controversy, 
This is chapter 29. It's called The Origin of Evil. Now, there's a couple of quotes here that seem pretty important. And, and I want to remind you, as usual, as we study, um, what does this have to do with me needs to be the question we're asking ourselves, right? We are told many times in the Bible, especially by Paul in the New Testament, to examine ourselves. So as we hear uh, and as we go through our study tonight, be thinking, how can this, how does this relate to me? Okay, like what can I do um, in my life? Uh, what, what applications, what principles can I learn? That'll draw me to Jesus, right? We, we need to know who Jesus is. We need to know who God is. So we're going to talk about this a little bit, but uh, it's very important that we follow God's will. Yes. Well, what if we don't know what his will is? How do we know his will? Is there a misperception of who God is in the world today? How about in the church? Does the church really know who God is? So we will go over and answer some of these questions. The more we study, the more we realize how little we know and how much we have to learn. So let these studies be a motivator to stir up a mind uh, to study, okay, and ask these questions. But let's start. This is Great Controversy. Uh, chapter 29, titled The Origin of Evil. The page number is going to be 492 in your Great Controversy. It says, to many minds, the origin of sin and the reason for its existence are a source of great perplexity. They see the work of evil with its terrible results of woe and desolation, and they question how all this can exist under the sovereignty of one who is infinite is in wisdom and power and love. Here is a mystery of which they find no explanation. And in their uncertainty and doubt, they are blinded to truths plainly revealed in God's word and essential to salvation. There are those who, in their inquiries concerning the existence of sin, endeavor to search into that which God has never revealed. Hence, they find no solution of their difficulties, and such as are actuated by a disposition to doubt and cavil seize upon this as an excuse for rejecting the words of Holy Writ, the Bible. Others, however, fail of a satisfactory understanding of the great problem of evil. From the fact that tradition and misinterpretation have obscured the teaching of the Bible concerning the character of God, the nature of his government, and the principles of his dealing with sin. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. I'm going to read that one more time. It is impossible. Satan's always trying to get my computer to reboot. All right, that's not part of the quote. Uh, it's, here's the quote again. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God and all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin, that there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is, a, it is mysterious, unaccountable, and to excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. That's pretty powerful, right? Only Our only definition of sin that given in the word of God, it is the transgression of the law. 
It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Before the entrance of evil, notice this, there was peace and joy throughout the universe. What was the condition of the universe before sin? There was peace and joy throughout the universe. All was in perfect harmony with the creator's will. Love for God was supreme. Love for one another, impartial. Christ the word, Christ the what? Christ the word, remember that, the only begotten of God was one with the eternal father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being in all the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ the Father, wrought in the creation of all heavenly beings. This is Colossians 1.16. By him were all things created that are in heaven, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And to Christ equally with the Father, all heaven gave allegiance. Have you ever thought or um, shared with somebody or heard somebody say, if God really was is love, if God is all-knowing, then why would he even create Lucifer if he knew he was going to sin? These are real questions. And they deserve to have real answers, don't they? That is a valid question for people to ask. How can sin exist? Right? How can there's there's people who think that God created a sinner? Now, as I'm looking at some faces that I know we've gone to church together, that's even within our church. People think that, don't they? And then I see other people who I know have gone to uh, and grown up in different churches. That's kind of how God is uh, taught also in other churches. And that's definitely the way the world views God. Why would a perfect being who's all wise and all knowing create Lucifer if he knew he was going to sin and all this sorrow was going to come? Those are good questions to ask, friends, but we need to have good answers to share with people. Uh, there's reasons uh, for this. Uh, one of the biggest reasons uh, why we ask this question is because we don't really know who God is. We don't know his will and we don't know his character. So as we in our studies get to know more about God's will, and his character, which we're going to study next week, uh, Satan's character is revealed. The more we learn about God, the more we see the light, if you will, the more Satan is exposed, right? And so as we, you know, any, any of these illustrations makes a lot of sense. You can, you can have a flashlight, uh, and looking in a room, you know, and, and, uh, see a crack in a wall or a, uh, you know, see a spider webs in the corner or something. But if you find the light bulb and replace it in that room and you turn on the, the light to the room, the whole room's illuminated. Now you see everything, don't you? There's a lot more. That's the way our walk is with God. It's like, you know, we've, we've got the Bible, we've got our light. It's shining. It reveals certain things, but the more, uh, the closer we, we draw to God, the more, uh, our vision, uh, gets better. Uh, the more we see the faults, um, the cracks in ourselves, but also we see uh, the deceiver and the enemy and what he's up to. God is, uh, uh, does God allow uh, Satan to be exposed and revealed? Uh, He sure does. So uh, we we have a choice to make. Let let me continue on with this next quote. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, continue on. It says the law of love being the foundation of the government of God. What's the foundation of the government of God? The law of love. And I'm not talking about love the way the hippies were talking about, you know, in the 60s or or 70s or whatever. Now, this is this is a love. Look, when we talk about peace, when we pray for peace and we pray for love, um, you know, we pray for energy and and uh, whatever it is that that we're needing um, from God and that we pray for him. Know that what comes from God's kingdom is not what comes from the earth, right? The peace that passes understanding, you know why it passes understanding? Because we don't see that kind of peace on earth. Have you guys, has anybody ever experienced that before? Do you know that, that God is with you? 
and what in a, a specific situation and you're like, I am really at peace with this and I normally wouldn't be. Have you ever said that before? If this was a year ago, I wouldn't be acting like this or I wouldn't be taking this the way I am. You know, the way God works in us is, is completely different than the way the world deals with us. The happiness of all created beings depended upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, homage that springs from an intelligent appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced allegiance. And to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. Does God force you to love him? Can't. You can't love God by force. The world doesn't see things that way, does it? So you need to accept things or else, right? That's the way the world is. So if God, because God doesn't uh, force allegiance, do you think Satan has a twisted version of that then? Mark down characteristics of God as we study. I have a list here that I write down when I see a characteristic or something of God that'll help me um, understand that better. Continuing on. Um, there was one who chose to pervert this freedom, though. Sin originated with him, who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and stood highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Before his fall, Lucifer was first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. Let's notice this in our Bibles, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. Beginning at verse 11. And notice this. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, to Ezekiel that is, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Now let me stop there real quick. Uh, was the king of Tyre in the Garden of Eden? Now, there's a spiritual application to this, right? So this is a message going to king of Tyre, but who's being discussed here? We're, we're going to see this more fully, but it's talking about Lucifer. See, this is where we get our inside scoop on, uh, on Lucifer. So notice verse 13. You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, I think some versions say tarots, were prepared for you the day you were created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways. From the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Verse 16, by the abundance of your trading. Now, who's got King James? It, does it say by the multitude of thy merchandise? I believe you can give me a nod if that's right. You, we got that right. The multitude. That, and that phrase is key. Uh, the new King James says by the abundance of your trading. New uh, King James says the multitude of your merchandise. You became filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of fiery stones. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Now, did you know that begins with the creation of Lucifer to the destruction of Satan? That's what that, what those texts are. Some people think that, uh, oh, because he's equal, oh, it's our everything in that's past. No, you've got, you've got the, the, the Lord describing the creation of Lucifer. And then you find out what Lucifer's issue is. Verse 18, when it says, by the iniquity of your trading, Leviticus 19 uses a similar um, 
uses a similar word to that in Hebrew, which is uh, transactions or tail bearing. You know what a tail bearer is? Is that like a word from the 1800s, you think? <laughs> Do we? A, a, a fibber, a liar. Do you know what the name devil means? What the word devil means? It means slanderer. Let's look at another verse here. Uh, oh, yeah, we took notes, so I would know where we're going. Let's go to Isaiah 14. Bet you some of you knew that, right? Isaiah 14. Paul, if you'll read verses, let's go uh, 12 through 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. What's Satan thinking? Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, as much as I would like to go on another avenue with that, we are restrained by time, which keeps these studies, I think, uh, doable, you know, by not having them too, too long. Does he have an eye problem? Big time. I'll ascend into heaven. Who's he want to be like? I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. What are stars? They're angels. You can see that in Revelation chapter one, the last verse in it. Um, and, and in other places too, I will also sit on the Mount of Congregation. Hey, who is Satan, Satan trying to be like? What does he mean also sit? Also sit with who? Sit with the Father. He's got a problem with Jesus, doesn't he? Look, the great controversy is a, is a war between Jesus and Satan. Let's have the Bible prove that. Turn your Bibles to Revelation, last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 12. Get a little bit more history. Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to begin at verse 3. Paul, if you'll have uh, the next one uh, on our on our list, then we'll try to, maybe the next two, yeah, um, on our list, the John and Psalm. But notice this, notice Revelation chapter 12. But I'm going to begin at verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red what? Dragon. What was it in heaven or what was it in Eden that, uh, that deceived Eve? It was a serpent, snake, right? What do you call a snake with wings? A dragon, that's interesting. Notice this though, a fiery red dragon having said seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head, on his heads. His tail, his what? His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What's another way of saying that? Satan deceived a third of the angels. Ellen White uses the expression almost half in the story of redemption. The dragon stood before the woman. Who's the woman in Bible prophecy? The church, right? Who is ready to give birth to devour her child. Who's the child? See the capital C in your Bible? That's Jesus, right? So you, you can see there's a symbolic, um, uh, the way this is written is symbolic, but it's talking about Jesus, it's talking about the church and what Satan, um, what's he, what he's planning on doing to church. We'll get that in a, uh, in a moment here. So she, uh, the dragon said before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron and her child what? was caught up to God in his throne. So did you see that this child was born in the beginning of verse 5? And at the end of verse 5, where is this child at? This child is Jesus, right? So the beginning of verse 5, Jesus is born. The end of verse 5, Jesus has already lived his life. Uh, he's died the death on the cross, rested in the tomb, resurrected out of the tomb, uh, walked around Jerusalem for 40 days uh, testifying and then ascended to the throne, right? And the reason I'm bringing that up is 
there's a lot in a text. Don't just glance through it. You know, sometimes you can go, you know, uh, a few years up to uh, thousands of years in history, just in one text. It's important that we, that we study carefully. The woman, that is the church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. See our Daniel studies for more information on that. And war broke out in heaven. Now, isn't that just the strangest place for a war to break out when we think about it? In heaven. A war breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, that's a cool text because you get all the identifying markers of Satan, other names for him, right? That old serpent, where do we know serpent from Genesis, uh, called the devil. What does devil mean? Slanderer. And Satan, what does Satan mean? Adversary. That's right. And uh, what what's his purpose? To deceive the whole world. Now, the only way we can know what deceptions the devil is doing is if we know who Christ is. Right? This comes back to the, the truth and the real versus the counterfeit and the error. Remember, we, we've talked about the three angels' messages. The first angel's message, you got to teach what truth is. The second angel's message, uh, you can reveal uh, error is revealed. Don't be drunk off the wine um, of Babylon, right? And then the third angel's message, which deals with the mark of the beast. uh, Hey, you either choose to follow the truth or you reject the truth and follow error. Satan deceives the whole world. How would you know Satan deceives? But let's go on this. It says at the end of this verse 9, He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What does that mean, Paul? John chapter 12, verse 31. If you guys can flip through it quickly, please do. But go ahead, Paul, when you're ready. John 12, 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, speaking of Satan, will be cast out. And verse 32. (laughs) Uh, and 32, and, yep. and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by the death that he would die, speaking of Jesus. Yeah. So uh, what death did he die then when he says, and I, if I be lifted up, was he lifted up off the ground? Yeah. On the cross, right? What was the result uh, with Satan? When Jesus, signifying the death he would die, he says, now is the judgment of this world. This is Jesus talking. It should be red letters. And if you guys have those Bibles that have red letter edition. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of the world that Jesus was talking about? He's talking about Satan. How did Satan get rule of the world? Did God give him the rule of the world? Did God create Satan and, and then create the earth just so we could be tormented all the time by Satan. Let's let's notice a text here. Uh, let's go to Psalm chapter eight. Notice something that uh, David says that he's thinking about. Psalms chapter eight, verses three through six. Go ahead, Paul. It says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him mm. and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Who did God give dominion of the earth to? Well, to Adam. And here David's contemplating what is man, by the way, that word in Hebrew man is Adam. I just love that. You know, it really could say like, oh, what is Adam that you've? Get created him a little lower than the angels. You know, there's a reason for that. And by the way, Paul quotes this same text when he's talking about Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Um, you know, when he's referring to Jesus, though, like that Jesus was created lower than the angels on earth. Did Jesus have a test to pass on earth? You know, and, and we see that uh, 
We see that constantly. Um, but in keeping with this for right now, so man's given dominion of the earth, but Jesus is saying in John chapter 12 that uh, Satan has dominion and that when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, when he dies on the cross, though, Satan would be cast down, him and all of his angels. Cast down from where? You know, uh, whoever has dominion of earth, you know, uh, traveled to and from earth to heaven. You ever read the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2? It says, and Satan, the sons of God met and Satan was there. And God asked him, hey, what are you doing? Where'd you come from? Oh, you know. Just traveling from here to there, representing good old earth that I have dominion over. How did he get dominion over the earth? Let's look in the next text in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans 6 and verse 16. And of course, we encourage you to study all of this on your own. Use your own Bibles. You've got texts that you guys loved using um, with this study, but... Uh, Let's uh, let's read this. All right, you there? Romans six sixteen says, "Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves, whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness." Um, did you get that? So whoever you obey, that's who you serve. That's your master. So how did Satan get dominion? over the earth when Adam was given dominion over the earth? Well, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3. You, Who you obey is who you are a slave to. And we'll actually, we'll start Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to go past these couple of bullet points on there, Paul. Um, we'll go to the next uh, section, Adam and Eve. I want you to notice this. Uh, this train of thought. Uh, Paul, will you read Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17? 15 through 17 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then God sees it's good. It's not good for man to be alone. And then he creates Eve. But I want you to notice something here. Did God give Adam instruction in regards to what he could and could not eat? He gives him uh, the uh, authority to eat from all the trees of the garden except for one. The command is not to eat from the fruit. For in the day that he does, he will die. Now, if you notice in Genesis chapter 3, Paul, if you'll read verses 1 through 6. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, so God gives Adam a command in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Satan, uh, through the medium of a, as the medium through a serpent, by the way, more cunning uh, can also be more subtle or defined as the most beautiful as well. Uh, of all creatures. When Lucifer was created, was he the most beautiful all, of all the created beings? So how fitting that he would choose the most beautiful of all the created beings on earth as a medium. You ever thought about that? That's who Satan is. That's, that's an exposing of his character, right? He's got to be, he's got to be the best. He's got to be uh, the most glorified. He's got to be the most adored uh, creature, um, cre 
creature that wants to be the creator. Notice the issue here. The woman talks to the serpent. I'd say that's the first issue, right? So her, where's her husband at? What's going on here? What's going on with this marriage, right? Why, why are the husband and, and wife uh, separate in this this uh, in this garden here? Maybe that's another study, right? But there's clearly some issue there, and I'm blaming the Hallmark Channel. Okay, it says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? She has to correct him, right? Because what God told Adam was that you can eat of every tree except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you will die. And then she adds a little something to it, right? It says, oh yeah, um, we can uh, eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, verse three, that's in the midst of the garden. God says, you shall not eat it nor touch it. Interesting. That's not what God told Adam, um, but I'll let you study that out for yourself, lest you die. And then notice, notice what he does. Here comes the deception. Look, so what's the truth? This is, this is the principle that, that I want to, uh, to be able to get across, Paul, uh, in, in our study here. What is the plain truth that we see in Genesis 2, 16? God says you can, and you guys, please use the chat window here. Um, I'd open this up for more discussion, but we've got a little bit more stuff to get through. Um, and I want to do this in one study, but the truth is God said, you can eat from every tree except for this one. Okay. That's the truth. When, if you eat the fruit of this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Okay. That's the truth. All these trees, good to eat. This one, no, if you eat from it, you'll die. Is that plain and clear? Right. It's, it's pretty plain and clear, right? It is uh, reading in Genesis two and notice how Satan works. First thing he says, verse four, you will not surely die. That's called a lie. And what's the first lie in regards to you'll live forever. Uh, what does the Bible say? Who, who, who only has immortality? Only God hath immortality. That's what scripture tells us, right? So we know that God said, if you eat it, you'll die. The, the serpent, Satan now tells her, no, you won't die. For God knows, he's, he's going to tell her now what God knows. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like who? You'll be like God. What did Satan say he wanted to be like in Isaiah chapter 14? I will be like the most high. I will be like God. So is this part of the lie that Satan is selling with his multitude of merchandise and that we read in Ezekiel chapter 28? By the way, that expression, multitude of thy merchandise or the abundance of your trading, have you heard the expression of, I'm not buying that? Or someone's telling you something, and you're like, I'm not buying what he's trying to sell. And, and, it, and he's, somebody's trying to give you a, sell you an idea. What, is, what does devil mean? slanderer. So who is he slandering? He's slandering God. What does it mean to slander? It means to lie about somebody's character. So the first thing Satan does is says, God's a liar. That's what he says. God says, don't eat this fruit. The day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Satan says, you won't die. That's calling God a liar. By the way, in Hebrews, we'll study next week. Did you know that God cannot tell a lie? That's one of his characteristics. God cannot lie. And Satan does what? Well, he's a slanderer. So he's going to say the opposite. God, um, you, you won't die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the way the world is today, right? We think we're like God because we determine what's right and wrong based on the scenario we're in. It's called situational ethics and probably a hundred other things. And we're really seeing it get put to use in these days, aren't we? the self-justification, I'm going to do this because, and then whatever feeling that individual is having, that's what they're going to use to justify their action. Did you know that's satanic? And that's actually the base philosophy of spiritualism. One of the, there's two great end time deceptions. The first one being the immortality of the soul. And what's the first thing Satan lies about? You will not surely die. Because if you don't, right, he's saying, um, you don't die. You'll be like God. You're God. How, how many religions and other beliefs and philosophies out there? Yeah, do what thou will. Uh, Satanist, uh, Crowley, right, said that uh, in the early 1900s. And then all the people that have followed him now, and there's still massive followings. 
you know, uh, the, the expression, do it that will live and let live. Don't judge me. Right. These are all expressions of just let me do what I want to do. Now, God has given you that freedom to do what you want to do. But that doesn't mean uh, one bit that uh, you get to decide whether or not you, you get to be somewhere that you don't live in harmony with. There's a lot of people that say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because God accepts me for who I am. Uh, he doesn't. I don't know. Some people may not like hearing that. What? Look, God will meet you wherever you are, whatever condition you're in, wherever you're at. He doesn't leave you in that condition. There is no biblical example where he leaves you in that condition, especially when you surrender your life to him. They always want to follow him. Read the story in the demoniac. Guy was in the boat, all dressed up, clean shaved, like, let's go. I'm going to row. Give me one of the oars. And Jesus said, no, nah, I need you to stay here. You know, you've got a witness to this town. God does not accept Laodiceans. So in Revelation chapter 3, he spews the lukewarm out of his mouth. And what I'm saying is God doesn't accept. He meets you where you are, and he'll take you out of wherever you're in. But you don't get to stay there and then say, well, I've, I've uh, professed that I'm a godly person. Um, you don't live it. Your heart doesn't change. And then expect to spend an eternity in that society. You would hate it. Change comes with our relationship with God. Every day is a change. All right, Paul. See, I knew we were going to go quick. I knew this was going to take a little longer, bro. Um, but I want you to notice what, this, what, did, what did Eve fall for? Come on. It says that she saw the fruit. She took the fruit. Who'd she take it from? You know, patriarchs and prophets says the serpent, when she said, God said, uh, not to eat it or touch it. That it's, she says the serpent plucked the fruit off the tree and put it in her hand. Who is, who is just saying that, uh, Satan looks for any little foothold that he can get in, in your life, right? Any little misperception that we have of God, he's going to challenge it. Look, he knows the Bible better than you do, better than I do. Doug Batcher used to say, uh, when he would meet with people and they say, ah, oh, if I'm not afraid of Satan, if, if I saw him, I'd just hold up my Bible in front of him. And he, he said, he always tell those people that Satan will just snatch the Bible out of your hand and read it to you. You think he's afraid of the Bible? Only if we know it. Did he tempt Jesus? How did Jesus respond when Satan tempted him? That's in uh, um, Matthew chapter 4. How did, how did uh, Jesus respond when Satan said, hey, you're hungry. You've been fasting. Turn these rocks into, into, into bread. How did Jesus respond? Nah, I'm good, man. I'm trying to fast. Now he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he quotes Deuteronomy. And Satan says, oh, you want to play, let's quote the Bible. And then Psalms, and then Satan quotes Psalms 91, right? When he says, you can just throw yourself off this cliff and your angels will catch you. They take charge of you, lest you dash your foot on a stone. You know, he leaves out part of that text that says to keep you in all, all your ways. Do you know what Christ's ways are? Read Psalms 91. It's all about the Father being a fortress and a refuge uh, to his people, keeping him safe. When, when, we, when we trust in the Lord, God keeps us safe. Satan wants us to not trust in the Lord. And as a result, we get caught up in Satan's snares. Is it important that we understand scripture? Eve was failed by her senses. She saw the fruit. She touched the fruit. She ate the fruit. She listened to the serpent uh, talking to her as she was engaged in that conversation. And uh, look, your taste and smell go together. You don't think that that tree smelled amazing? I can't imagine uh, you know, the, the whole garden had to, our noses can't even imagine what, uh, what that garden smelled, especially mine. And after having COVID, I can hardly still smell anything years later. She failed by her senses. Satan convinces people to trust their senses and not the plain instruction of God. God said, don't eat the fruit of this tree or you'll die. Satan says, God's a liar. Notice how you're feeling. Listen to me talking. Look how it tastes. And he goes on and on. 
This is called spiritualism, friends. And when we decide what's best for ourselves and it's outside of what God has commanded, guess who we say we're saying we are? We're saying we're God. And you may think, oh, I would never say anything. When you determine what's right or what's wrong outside of what God says is right or wrong, you're putting yourself in the place of God. Guess what you did? You bought what Satan was selling. And look, the only way we can overcome this is by having scripture as our safeguard. There's a way to not be deceived by Satan. There's a way to overcome um, his attacks. He convinced nearly half, or th- the Bible says a third. Ellen White says almost half. He convinced almost half of the angels, the angelic host, um, bought what he was selling. That's how serious this is, right? Now, we encourage you to look up other examples. You can throw them in the chat if you want of uh, people in the Bible where we get these examples of people who followed God and the result and people who didn't follow God and what the result was. We came up with a few uh, with Cain and Abel, you know, as a result of obedience to God um, with Noah. Noah looked a little crazy for 120 years, didn't he? Right until he didn't when it started to rain. David and Goliath, you have a man of war and Goliath and then a shepherd that tore up a lion trying to catch his sheep, but no less a shepherd. He couldn't even fit in armor, lift, barely lift a Goliath's sword up, right? What about Abraham and all the, the people we see in Hebrews chapter 11? Those are, those are all great examples of people who, um, who listen to God. And you got people like Nadab and Abihu. Like they know what God said, but they brought strange fire into the temple. How'd that work out? Yeah, they got more than a sunburn. That's for sure. About Hophni and Phineas, also priests, high priests. These, these are people in the church. They lost the Ark of the Covenant. They thought it was a good luck charm. And uh, their father fell over and died. Their father, Eli. These are, look, there is, it's drastic. It's, it's insane, uh, the results of, uh, rejecting God's plain commands in his word uh, in place for um, for feeling, for sensationalism or for power. King Solomon, you see a man who's obedient. He's so wise, everyone wants to come and get his advice until he wasn't wise and then did all sorts of crazy things. You know, he was sacrificing kids. He married a bunch of heathen women and adopted their practices. The good news is he came back. But he wasn't quite the same person, was he, When uh, before all of that? And you get to see that in Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. Uh, you get to see and you, you can hear the tone of his voice when you read how it changes from his life experiences. Now, Scripture is safeguard in your, in your um, great controversy. Paul, I'll have you read the first couple of paragraphs. But look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these, these quotes or uh, these texts, all right? Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. I know some of y'all know this. Let me, let me read your lips. If they speak not according to this word is because there is no light in them. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. That's your Bibles. What's truth? Your Bibles. What does the Bible do? Sanctifies you. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. I'm talking about his church in the relationship of the husband and wife, we're talking about the church, uh, with the washing of water by the word. John 1, 1 through 14, please read it, but you know the text uh, that uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then you read on down in the text uh, that the word became flesh. It's talking about Jesus. John 5, 24 and 38 he who hears my word, my words and believes, right? We're not to just read the Bible, but we're to trust in the Lord. Uh, we're to believe in him. Um, we, we talked about the temptations. In fact, notice all the temptations and how Jesus, every response that Jesus says to Satan is from the word. And it's from Deuteronomy, no less. Uh, let's go ahead and read this quote. We'll see how fast we can do this, Paul. This is... Uh, the chapter in Great Controversy called Scripture's a Safeguard. 
It says the people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining a knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. At every revival of God's work, the prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. And uh, Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. Mm -hmm. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified their mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Now, friends on Zoom, you're not seeing these paragraphs if you don't have the book, but on YouTube, you are seeing this and you're going to see some words underlined. Um, but uh, the counterfeit resembles the truth that it'll be impossible to distinguish between them, except from Holy Scriptures. You know, 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their, their, their own desires, because they have itching ears. An itching ear is, I want to just hear what I want to hear. They will heap up for themselves teachers. That time has finally come. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because, notice this, because it interferes with the desires of the sinful world-loving heart. And Satan supplies the deceptions, which they love. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, that's the highest, the smartest people on earth, right? The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils as numerous in this cordant, as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Check this out. Before accepting any doctrine, that means any belief or precept, anything anybody says, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord. What's happened in Adventist church? <laughs> People of the word, we're supposed to be calling for a thus saith the Lord, but this is for everybody. Anything anybody says, show me in the Bible. I need to see that for myself. Give me a thus saith the Lord. The truth and the glory of God are inseparable. It is impossible for us with the Bible within our reach. How many have Bibles in your home? More than one, even. Uh, to honor God by erroneous opinions. We, if we got a Bible nearby, how, how do we honor God in error? Many claim that it matters not what one believes as long as his life is only uh, right. But the life is molded by faith. If light and truth is within our reach and we neglect to improve the privilege of hearing and seeing it, we virtually reject it. We're choosing darkness rather than light. And it's the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scriptures, what is truth? What do you learn from? Not from me, right? We share it, but you need to learn. We're pointing to the scriptures, right? It's from the scriptures where you get truth. Then you walk in the light. So you don't just learn a thing, you learn it and then do it and encourage others to follow his example. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought, comparing scripture with scripture, with divine help, 
We are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. Paul, enlighten us with this last quote. When the testing time shall come, those who have made God's word their rule of life will be revealed. In summer, there is no noticeable difference between evergreens and other trees. But when the blasts of winter come, the evergreens remain unchanged, while other trees are stripped of their foliage. So the false-hearted professor may not now be distinguished from the real Christian, but the time is just upon us when the difference will be apparent. Let opposition arise, let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway. Let persecution be kindled, and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian will stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter than in days of prosperity. Says the psalmist, thy testimonies are my meditation. Through my precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. That's Psalms 119. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be care, uh, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Proverbs 13 and Jeremiah 17. Yeah, and those are, that's Psalms 119, 99 and 104. That's a big chapter, but uh, let opposition rise. Let bigotry and intolerance bear sway. Is this the way the world is? Let persecution be kindled and the half-hearted and hypocritical. That's the people in the church. That's what it's saying. Because what hypocrite wants to be persecuted, right? So as these things take place, you're going to see a sifting of the wheat and the tares. And uh, I love I love what David writes. So thy testimonies are my meditation. Thy precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way because every false way comes from Satan. I hope this just stirs up a mind to study so that we can learn how to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5. Lean not on your own understanding. In all, uh, in all your ways, acknowledge. Acknowledge me in all your ways, right, is what, is what Jesus says. And, he, and he'll guide our paths. We got to trust in the word. Only those who have fortified their minds with the word will be able to withstand Satan and uh, all of his weapons and all of his deceptions. But with God, the victory is already there. So next week, we're going to uh, study more about God's character to help encourage us to trust in him. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful uh, that you're God and that you have given us a way to see clearly, uh, to be able to see the way the world is, to be able to see uh, who you are and that that exposes uh, your adversary the devil and Satan, a dragon, a deceiver, uh, who represents everything uh, hateful and uh, anything peaceful. Help us to know you better, to learn how to trust in you in all things, that we would be better people today than we were yesterday. We pray for the strength to endure another day. Heavenly Father, if this is our last night on earth, uh, please, we don't want any sins with us. Uh, we want to die in Christ and we live, or do we want to live in Christ? So we just give our hearts to you, um, to purify. We thank you so much for everything that you do for us. I thank you so much for everybody that's participating in this study. And I'm so glad that you love them. You know all the hairs on their head. You know everything about them and what they're going through. I pray that we would all have that peace that comes from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we'll see you next time. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.